God. Man, that is our prayer as followers of Jesus Christ. That has got to be who we are. It's gotta, it is so in our DNA to be salt and light for the world to see. You know, the last couple of weeks we talked about that, that we are the salt, the flavor to this world, and we're the light to lift up God and reflect his glory. And when we do that, not only are we a, a light to shine out in this world, but you know what happens in us? Man, there is a peace that comes in our life. When we are following Jesus Christ, there should be a peace in our life that is so beyond what the world knows about peace. And if you're not experiencing that, this morning, I want to show you some of the, 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 the traps that we fall into that keep us from experiencing God's peace. And it really has to do with patience. You know, one of the fruits of the spirits, uh, the fruits of the spirit says, you know, uh, that we're to be filled with love, joy, peace, and patience. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think that fruit rots on the vine. And we miss out on, on God's peace for us. Because we lose our patience. Anybody need patience this morning? Come on. Come on. Say us online. If you need patience this morning, would you just, would you just put in there patience, you know? We need patience with each other. We need patience when we're driving. We need patience wherever we go. You know, one of the hallmarks that has changed the world so many times is when followers of Jesus Christ exhibit patience in their life. It's something that was so unusual. You see, patience was ideally from those that were enslaved, they had to be patient, or those who were lower class had to be patient because those above them socioeconomically, they were impatient. And so when Christians, when followers of Jesus Christ exhibit that, it speaks loudly to the world when we exhibit patience. But so often, man, we get caught up in all the busyness of life and we lose that quality. I mean, we have seen that through this pandemic and through the racial uh, uh, rise, the racial tension that's risen, and, and we've seen that through the political season and how, how patience is lost. And we need to step back and we need to say, why? Why do we struggle with it? And so the title of this message this morning, this morning is, why is God making me wait? God, I want patience and I want it. Now, I think we got to go to the Bible, of course, and find out how we get patience and, and, and why God puts us in his waiting room sometimes. How many of you like to sit in the waiting room? Anybody like to sit in the waiting room? I don't know about you, but I don't like the waiting room. The other day, I, you know, I need a haircut, if you can tell. I need a haircut. And... Uh, you know, the cool thing about it is I got an app on my phone now that tells me the wait time. You got one of those? It tells you the wait time. So I'm sitting there and I look at it and I say, you know, honey, I think I'm going to go get my hair cut. And I look at it and it said six minutes. And I live about two minutes from the hair place. And I, I'm like, I'm like, nah, I'll just wait a minute. I'll wait till it goes to zero. So a little bit later, I look and it's 20 minutes. A little bit later, I look, and it's 90-something minutes. And I'm like, man, I missed out. Why? Because I wouldn't wait for six minutes. You know? Impatience. Impatience. You know, the Bible is full of examples of, our, of God's people being impatient. I mean, we can just go through a list and, and see how many people struggled with impatience. You know, God, Abraham, uh, God gave Abraham a dream, right, of being the father of many nations. And, and, 
Abraham was like 90 years old. I mean, he was an old man and didn't have a son. And then God comes to Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. Here's my dream. And Noah has this dream of building the ark. How long did it take him to build it? 120 years. I don't know about you, but that is way too long to work on one project. Joseph, going to be ruler in Egypt, you know, God had told him that his brothers would bow down to him. And Joseph winds up in Egypt and spent 13 years in jail, waiting, God's waiting room. And then David, anointed king, but he didn't become a king immediately. No, the king of present, Saul, chased him around the countryside. <laughs> There's always a delay when we get God's dream, when we get God's idea for us. There's always a delay between the fulfillment of it and what happens. And what happens in this is that God wants us, he wants to do two things in us as we're waiting in his waiting room. And they are, the first thing is that that he's preparing us for something. He's getting us ready for something. Because so often when, when we're getting ready to do something for God, so often we're not at the point that God has us or wants us to be to be able to use us. And so he's got to prepare us. He's got to take us through things so that we grow. You see, God's not concerned... He is, God is so concerned about your growth. You know that? I was reading a leadership book that someone gave me from John Maxwell. It's called Leader Shift. And in the book, he says, you know, for years I focused on numbers. He was a pastor and he focused on numbers. And, and he said, you know, we'd reach a number and, and it, it, it just never was fulfilling. But then he realized he needed to switch his thinking, not to numbers, but to growth. How am I helping someone grow? See, what happened was he left one church that he'd helped grow. And when he left, the church, you know, went down. Why? Because he didn't pour into people and grow them. And he saw that and he needed to help with that. And so that's what we need to do. We need to think about how does God want me to grow when I'm in his waiting room? What's God doing? What's God preparing me for? And then the second thing is, is that God uses these delays in our life so often to test us. I think every time I get on 64, it's a test. You know, it's a test. How am I going to do today? You know, on the way to church, you know what I like to do on the way to church is I like to do the speed limit. That's a big deal for me, okay? That is a big deal for me. But you know what it does? It lowers, I'm being honest here. You know what it does? It lowers my stress level. I use cruise all the time. So I put it on, you know, I put it on 60 and I'm coming down 199. And and it's just so calming I'm going, why don't I do this more often? Why don't I do this more often? I don't have to worry about, oh, no, here, there's a policeman. Okay, I'm in trouble now, you know? Anybody else guilty of that? Come on, come on, come on. <clears throat> when Pharaoh, when God was delivering the people of Israel with Moses, you know that story. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, listen to this. God did not lead them directly, though the way was shorter. Get that? He didn't lead them directly to the promised land, which was only about a two-week walk. Okay? How long did it take them to get to the promised land? Anybody? Forty years. Forty years. Man, you talk about a good walk ruined. Sounds like my golf matches. God did not lead them directly, though the way was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. They weren't ready. They weren't ready to face any difficulty. And you see that throughout their journey. And then it says, God led you through the wilderness for 40 years, testing you to find out how you would respond and if you 
would obey him. Is anybody in the waiting room this morning? Are you in God's waiting room this morning? Well, I want, I want, to, I want to give you four things to do while you're in God's waiting room. And the first one is this. Don't fear. Don't fear. That's the first mistake that the Israelites made. Man, there are so many reasons for us to end up in God's waiting room. And, and sometimes they're not even our fault, right? Other people have things that cause us to wait. And yet fear is one of those things that, that piles on us and keeps us from experiencing God's peace in our life. If you're not experiencing God's peace in your life right now, there might be something there might be a relationship issue with, between you and God. Maybe you don't have a relationship through Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. But maybe you're allowing fear to keep you from having peace. Fear of what? Oh, how about fear of what others think about me? You ever struggle with that? Man, I was sitting praying this morning. It was like, wow, God just convicted me of that this morning. And it was like, man, I don't need to fear what other people think. I need to be your voice, God. I want to be your mouthpiece, God, to say what you want me to say. Don't fear. The problem is, man, fear keeps us in that waiting room, in that wilderness, in that desert stage of life. And it, and it makes the delay seem even longer, even longer. Instead, look, look what the Bible says. It says, they would not enter the land. They said, we are what? Afraid. We're afraid. The people there are stronger and taller than we are. I mean, God had promised them, look, I'm going to take you in there. I'm going to take care of whatever comes your way. I'm going to fight your battles. I'm going to take care of the enemy. And God still tells us that today. He will go with us, right? He will fight the battles that, that we need to, to fight. He'll take care of the giants in the land. And yet, man, they got their eyes on the giants instead of the giant slaying God that we serve. And they got full of fear. What is it that puts fear in your life? Is it fear of failure? Is it fear of approval? Is it fear of performance? What is it that while you're waiting, man, this fear just grows and, and you feel like, man, I, I just got to do something. You know what happens? What we need to focus on instead of our fear is on God's presence. See, that's the answer to it. Instead, we need to focus on God's presence. Look what Isaiah says. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Read that with me. Fear not, for I am with you. Let's say that one more again. Fear not, for I am with you. If you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, I pray that you would get this. That there is nowhere you can go. There is nothing you can do. That you can escape God's presence in your life. No matter the difficulty that you're facing today, no matter how big this fear is that you're up against, maybe it's fear of financial failure, maybe it's fear of this pandemic, this virus that, that seems to go on and on. Anybody tired of waiting for that? Man, you know. But even in the midst of the valley, even in the very most difficult time God says I am with you God promised Jesus promised I will never leave you I'll never for I will never forsake you man that is one of the greatest gifts that God gives us that man he's with us no matter what happens he's with us fear not for I am with you do not be dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. 
you know, I've said it several times, you know, there's like 365, 366 times in the Bible that it says, do not fear. One for every day, right? We don't have to be afraid. We just, what? We cling to God's presence. You know he's with us right now. He is in this very room. If you don't feel his presence, it's because you aren't aware of it. He's here. Man, I promise you, he's in this place. You know why? Because he's in my life. He's in your life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. He never leaves you. He will always be with you through whatever comes. So don't be afraid. The second thing is don't fret. F-R-E-T if you don't understand my southern. Don't fret. Don't worry. Anybody worry? Man, I come from a long line of worriers. I could be a professional worrier. How about you? I should get paid to worry, right? Don't fret. On the way, the people lost their patience, and they spoke against God and Moses. They complained. You see, I think we sometimes we think that when we're in the waiting room, that sometimes we can just complain, and it makes us feel better. Anybody ever experienced that? When you're waiting on something, you just complain about it, and you just think, man, I just... Does that make you feel better? No, you know what it does? It makes it worse, doesn't it? Because then you see all the things that are, are wrong. You, you, you're sitting there and you're fretting. And, and then you go, well, maybe I can do something about it. Maybe I can help God. Because God's, you know, maybe God's busy here. And maybe I can get involved and I can take care of this situation. Can you think of a time in the Bible when that took place? How about Abraham? You remember Abraham? You know, father of many nations. He's getting older. I mean, 90, 90. You know, and he just... You know, he's getting older and older, and he's going, yeah, okay, God, you promised that, that I'd be the father of many nations, and Sarah comes to him, his wife, and says, you know, God promised us this, and it's not happening, so uh, I think we need to help God a little bit. What do you think? So he kind of took Sarah's handmaiden, right? And had a man, you talk about the trouble that that caused. When you hear there's Middle East trouble, when there's trouble between Israel and the other Arab nations over there, you, it's just a family problem. It is a, a sibling rivalry going on. So Abraham took Hagar, the, the handmaiden, had a baby, Ishmael, because he got impatient waiting on God. Man, when we get impatient and we try to help God out, we create such a mess. Such a mess. Don't fret. Don't worry about it. Look what it says in Proverbs. Impatience will get you into trouble. Anybody, can I get an amen on that? Man, anybody ever gotten in trouble because you got impatient? Man, I can tell you... Uh, Years ago when our kids were little and, and we were doing church and, and God hadn't healed me of, of uh, a lot of stuff in my life, I was so impatient on Sunday mornings. Come on, honey, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. And it caused more issues in our marriage because of my impatience. Turning off lights. Come on, it's time to go. We got to, you know, turn the light. Boy, you talk, ooh, where's Myra? Don't fret. Instead, trust God's timing. Look what Psalm says. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him to act. Isn't that so hard? Rest in the Lord. That doesn't sound like stress, does it? Rest. Rest. Rest in the Lord. Trust his timing. Don't fret and worry. It only leads to harm. He tells us that right there. And yet, so often, we try to get in there and work it out before God has a plan. I've done that so many times in my life. And there was one time that I didn't do that, and God really blessed. And that was, we, we moved to Williamsburg in 1994 for 10 weeks to do a, to do a survey project through the seminary. 
And we got up here and we started going door to door and neighborhood to neighborhood and trying to figure out, you, you know, was there a need for a new church here? And what kind of church would it take to, to reach the people here? And so we went to surveys and we did these surveys. And man, I just, we just fell in love with the people here and, and just had this passion for the people here. And we went back to seminary and, and uh, I was just praying, God, you know, make a way for us. And we had met some pastors here and one pastor said, you know, man, it'd be great if you could come and, and start a church here. And, you know, our church has set aside money for a new church work here in the Williamsburg area, but we already got somebody else going to do that. And I thought, oh, well, that's encouraging. You know, so we went back, and, and I just began praying. I said, God, you know, so many times I've gotten in your way, and I've rushed things, and this time, God, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to trust you, and I'm going to trust your timing. And so we were back at seminary for about three months or so, and and an opportunity came. You see, God had put a passion in my heart to start, a, start church, you know, to be a church planter. And so we went back to seminary, and that passion was still there. And I was trying to read everything. I was trying to finish up uh, seminary very quickly. And just, just, you know, man, God, I just got its passion. And there was this opportunity that came up that we could go to Africa and start churches and finish our degree. So uh, it was a win-win, right? I mean, I could finish our degree. We could go to Africa and be missionaries and, and start churches. And I came home and started talking to Myra about it. And we were reading things. And she was going to you know, we were gonna have to learn how to pluck chickens and, and, you know, do all that kind of stuff. You know, very rural. And uh, so it was a big deal. But we had to make a decision that weekend because I had to apply. The deadline was Monday. I found out on Friday, and I'm like, okay, God, what do you want us to do? So Friday, we're praying, we're, we're talking, and Saturday morning, we get up, and we're talking, and we're praying, and, and we just said, you know, okay, God, whatever you want to do, we're willing to do it. About 8 o'clock that night, I got a phone call from David Smith at Bay Rivers Community Church in Newport News. Now it's... Uh, their church, Bay Rivers and Tidewater went together and they formed Coastal Community Church. Maybe you heard of it. <clears throat> David called and he said, hey, we want you guys to come and start the church. And we've got some money set aside to help you do it. You see, God's timing was perfect. He, he wanted me, what? He was preparing me. He was getting me ready. But the most important thing he wanted me to do was to be willing to go wherever he wanted me to go and that's what he wants in your life wherever he wants you to go whatever he wants you to do you're willing to say i'll go i'm going to trust you i'm going to trust your time and you know what that time was so uh it was a struggle because i was fighting against trying to do something but you know what it was peaceful at the same time because man i just put it in god's hand and your timing's right and i'm just going to trust you with it i didn't worry about it like i usually do and god's timing's right rest in the lord wait patiently for him to act and then ecclesiastes says god has the right time for everything so don't fret don't worry and then number three is don't faint. Don't faint. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses. If only we had died in Egypt. You ever said something like that? Man, if only we'd been here. If only we'd have done that. You know, he says, don't faint. You know, if only we died in we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. You see, they lost heart. They got discouraged with what was going on around them. They got discouraged and fed up with it. And yet God says, don't faint. What do we do instead of fainting? Yeah, we what? We be persistent and we pray. We have a tenacity about us that won't give up. So many times, God's answer is right around the corner, and yet when we give up, we miss out on that opportunity. No telling how many times God has been right there about to do something, and we gave up. 
You ever given up on something? Man. You talk about discouragement? Be persistent and pray. Put your hands in God's hands. Be persistent. Let us never grow tired of doing what's right. If we do not, read this with me. We read this too fast. Let us never grow tired of doing what's right. For if we do not faint, listen, if we do not faint, here it comes, we'll reap a harvest at the right time. You know, my dad always had a garden growing up. My dad loves to garden. He's not able to do it. He's almost 97. He'll be 97 March the 4th. But he always had a garden. And one of the things about farming and gardens and that sort of thing is this. You always get more than you sow. I helped dad plant the garden. Garden. I usually did the tilling. And he, you know, we'd come along and we, you ever planted corn? You take three corn, corn seeds, corn, corn, and you plant them in the ground, you know, in a hill kind of thing. Do you only get three kernels back? No, man. You, you get stalks that produces thousands of kernels. That's the way God is. But you know what, what it is? There's always a season of waiting. You know what I hated to wait on was the tomatoes. I love tomato sandwiches. Put some good old Duke's mayonnaise on two slices of bread with salt and pepper and tomatoes. Oh, my goodness. Ain't nothing better. But, you all, I mean, it seemed like it took forever for these plants to grow and produce tomatoes. But you got to wait. Because if you go out there too quick, you can pull them green. That's when you fry them, had fried green tomatoes then. But you know what? You can't have that good old tomato sandwich without waiting for the right time. So what is it that God's wanting you to persist through, to pray through, to get, maybe it's this time that we're in right now. Maybe it's this season that we're in right now. You know, we're not going to always have to do it the way we're doing it right now. I, I pray to God not, right? I mean, the social distancing and all that kind of thing. I want, you know what I'm missing? You guys know. A hug. I miss hugs. Man. Be persistent and pray. You know, football's, the playoffs are today. In two weeks, we'll see the Super Bowl. What makes a really good football game? You know, I was thinking about this. You know what really good football is? Is when, when the team gets behind and they're in the fourth quarter. You know? My cardiac cats, the Panthers, they're known for that. They're, they'll be behind. But you know what really takes it to a whole new level is when that quarterback gets behind it and he marches down. You know, Tom Brady has done that how many times? Over and over and over again. Be behind and just march them down the field. I'll never forget a preseason game at the Panthers. You know, we were sitting there watching and, and Tom Brady had been uh, out and he comes in and we, we had, you know, we had done well. And then Tom Brady comes in and it's like, they went from high school team to NFL team. It was like he took them to a whole new level and just marched them down the field and scored. It was like, man, are we even on the field anymore? You see, that's what makes a really good team. When, when you're behind, you keep pushing through and you score, you know? And that's what God is calling us. Don't give up. So many times when the pressure, we've become followers of Jesus Christ. You ever known anybody like this? They come to Christ, and then there's something difficult in their life that happens, and they abandon him. They walk away. They lose heart. Don't look at people, because people will let you down, right? You keep your eyes on God. You be persistent. You keep pushing through. 
Pray continually. Look what it says. You need to pray continually and not lose heart. Don't give up. Hang on. You remember that? Now, some of you my age uh, might remember this. You remember that, that poster with the cat? And it said, hang on, baby. You know, hang on, baby. Right? That's what we need to do. Just hang in there. Keep pressing forward. Don't give up. Don't worry. Don't fear. And then number four, don't forget. Don't forget. It says in the Bible, it says, They forgot the many times God showed them his love, and they rebelled at the Red Sea. Here's the children of Israel. I, you know, we think... We think so often, man, if I was back there, man, I'd be so different than those children of Israel. You know, I'd be so different. You know, they saw God come through 10 times with 10 different miracles that took place. You remember the plagues came, the plagues came, the virus came, and God showed up, right? And then God would deliver And then God did the ultimate. He took the firstborn child, right? But the children of Israel, when they got to their home and they had the blood, man, it reminds me of Jesus, doesn't it? The blood, and they would pass over that house. The angel of death would pass over that house. Have you ever forgotten what God's done for you in the past? Boy, I have. When times get hard and difficult, it's so easy to forget. The children of Israel, they had just seen God do ten miracles. And then they're leaving, and they get down to the Red Sea. And it's like, okay, God's brought us here to kill us, right? They're complaining. No, God was just going to do another miracle. And what did he do? He opened the Red Sea up, and they walked through on dry ground. But we forget, don't we? We forget what God has done. The greatest miracle that God has ever done is through his son, Jesus Christ, who forgives our sin and gives us hope and gives us peace. You see, when we receive Christ into our life, when we accept and believe that he's God's son, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and when we place our trust in him, what happens? Man, he gives us himself. He gives us himself into our life. That's why he says the fruit of his spirit that lives within us is love, joy, peace, and patience. You see, you've already got God's patience inside of you. It's a matter of surrendering your life to him, of not worrying, of not fretting, of not fainting, of not forgetting, and allowing him to produce that fruit through you. When you get impatient, you are not producing God's fruit. When you get impatient, you are what? You are trying to supersede what he wants to do in your life. God's got a plan. God's got you where he wants you right now. Wherever you are, whatever job you're in, he's got you there to what? To be salt and light. And how do you produce? How do you show people your salt and light? Patience is one of those things. Man, what a great testimony. When the world is in chaos around us, that we can step up and be patient and waiting on God. Don't forget all that God's done. But he saved them as he promised. But they quickly forgot again. Sounds just like me. Does that sound like you? They wouldn't wait for God to act. So what do we need to remember? We need to remember God's promises. I will bless the Lord and not forget the great things he does for me. In 2 Peter, it says, The Lord is not being slow to carry out his promises, but he is being patient with you. These things won't happen right away. What things? These things won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely. I don't like those words. You like those words? Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow... Do not despair, for these things will surely come to pass. 
just be patient. Just wait on God. Wait on his timing. They will not be overdue a single day. You see, the Bible says that at just the right time, God sent his son. At just the right time. And God will get us through and deliver us from what we need to be delivered from at just the right time. But it's a matter of us trusting him and putting our faith in him, remembering what he's promised. He's put so many promises in this, this Bible, this love letter to us. I think there's six, 7,000 promises that God has made to us. They've even got uh, books with scripture in it that's just the promises of God. You, you know, I've got some of the, you, you ever seen those? You need to look at those promises of God and just read through them. How many times God has promised, and the greatest promise of all is that he's promised to be with us. Don't ever forget that. He promised us if we would believe Jesus, invite him into our life, Ask him for forgiveness. Believe that God raised him from the dead. Choose to make him Lord of our life. The leader. The king of our life. He promised to never leave us. Never forsake us. That no matter what you go through. The darkest days. He will be with you. He's with us now. He'll be with us tomorrow. So no matter what you face, rest in that assurance. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, so often we get so impatient, Lord. I, our society, our country, God, it seems that we're built about impatience. Because when we see a problem, we want to fix it, and we want to fix it now. And somehow, sometimes God... You want us to sit with the issue so that we can learn and prepare and be who you want us to be. Sometimes it's a test, God. And, and God, so often we fail. And I'm sorry, God, for the times that I've failed in, this, in your waiting room. But God, this morning I want to come before you and, and, and with my friends here. And, and God, we just want to, we, we don't want to fear anymore. We don't want to fret. We don't want to. We don't want to faint, God, and we don't want to forget. We want to remember who you are, that you are with us. God, I know in this room, online, God, there's so many things and so many issues that we go through that, that bring discouragement and despair, and things that we've prayed for maybe, and, and maybe you're, you've answered, but you're not, you're, you're just saying, wait. And so, God, we want to trust you in this moment. God, I know there's a lot of sickness around and things happening. And sometimes, God, you tell us we got to wait. And it's so hard. We want to trust you, God. If you're here this morning and you need to know that relationship so that God will always be with you. Would you just pray this prayer? Jesus, I know that you're God's son. I believe that you died on the cross for me to pay my penalty that I deserve. And you set me free from that bondage of sin, God. When you rose from the dead, and I believe you rose from the dead, and I want to invite you into my life to forgive me and give me a new life. And as you promised, I want to follow you all my days. And I rest on that promise that when we do that, you come in and fill us with your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control, God. You fill us to overflowing. We accept that gift. If you did that today, I'd love to hear from you. God, we give you ourselves today. We rest in you. We rest in you. Would you just say that with me? We rest in you. You are able to de-stress us, God, if we rest in you. In Jesus' name, amen.